Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. I am Virgin, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, right, everybody. I said that I was an alcoholic. I am a sober alcoholic. Sober by the grace of God, and through the instrument that he chose to grant me this sobriety, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Out of curiosity, I would just like to see a show of hands of how many of you were here ten years ago. That's great. (laughs) This is the tenth This is the (laughs) tenth memorial for Bill W., Bill Wilson, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill died in January ten years ago, and through an announcement from the General Service Conference, it was suggested to all AA groups that a memorial service be held for Bill and including Dr. Bob approximately on February 14th. And I wonder how many groups have followed that memorial for our founder, even though it might be just a moment of silent meditation. Lillian, ten years ago, instituted into the program of the Pine Mountain Fellowship a memorial service for Bill and Dr. Bob, and it was my privilege at that time to conduct that memorial, and with the exception of two years, it was beyond my control to be here, I have continued to have that privilege, and I am delighted that I could be here on the 10th anniversary. I looked back for this meeting in my papers, and I found the very thing that I read here ten years ago. I keep most of my old papers, and with the exception of changing a couple of dates in it, I think that it would be apropos if I would repeat today what was said on that Sunday morning ten years ago. Ten years ago, an announcement in the news media stated, William Griffith Wilson, age 75, 
died late Sunday night, January 24th, 1971, at Miami, Florida. The paper went on to say, this man, at his request, was revealed to be the Bill W., co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous in 1935. I like to believe that here is the paradox that lets us know as alcoholics to receive we must give and must die that we may live. William Griffith Wilson had to mortally die that he might be born as our beloved Bill W. and live forever. Not only in the lives of we alcoholics who knew him, but in his place of respect and honor by all humanity for the precious gift of sobriety, he helped so many thousands to find. I like to believe that our Bill, in his conscious contact with God as he understood him, knew that he was soon to join him. I like to believe this because a few short years ago he had shared what little strength he had left to appear before 11,000 AAs from all over the world. He shared a brief moment of his life to pass on to them his example of hope through this program. I like to believe that at the moment of his passing, each of those 11,000 who stood, heads bowed, each holding the hand of an AA next to him, in a never-ending chain of love, still carried the memory of that moment of prayer for his recovery, should it be God's will. I like to believe that our Bill, ever so weary in body, yet so strong and determined in will and heart, that our program go on and on in its strength and growth quietly reached out his hand to his higher power, and together they walked in the new path to join Dr. Bob. I like to believe that Bill is now sharing a wonderful reward, telling Dr. Bob all about what has happened in the past 31 years since he left and a wonderful reunion with the thousands of AAs who have gone on before us, Ebby, Sister Ignatia, Bill Dotson, Dr. Tebow, and the countless AAs now members of the blessed group across the horizon. What a wonderful meeting they must have, for each have now had the true and lasting spiritual experience. I like to believe and keep ever in mind that Bill was a dedicated man, devotedly trying to help others find a new way of life. He sought no reward. He sought no fame, only the privilege to be of help to others who still suffered. He abhorred the thought of ever being placed on a pedestal or glorified for what he had done. His only thought was for others. I shall always treasure the privilege of having known Bill personally, to visit his home with he and Lois, and to work with him. During my ten years in the General Service Conference, it was inspiring to see the dedication, sincerity, and enthusiasm he displayed in each session. 
This was even more of an inspiration because of the fact we all knew he was a sick man then. I only wish all of you could have had those few moments with Bill as I did. And had you done so, I know you would be as determined as I to keep AA as it is, and as Bill and Bob hoped it would remain forever. I like to believe that although Bill is now co-sponsor of the Blessed Group, he will always slip in for a moment to sit at our little meetings. Listen to a question that puzzles us. We'll answer our question by example, and above all, that his memory shall always keep us firm in our endeavor to carry on the God-given program of AA he was allowed to bring us. What greater tribute to his memory can we pay than a day at a time, practice the principles of the program he gave us until the time when we too may join him again and tell him what happened since he left. If you will, let us all please stand and join hands and be in the spirit of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, with whom we would walk day by day, we thank Thee for those whose lives have touched ours, leaving their marks of influence upon our hearts, minds, and souls. As debtors to them, may we resolve in our own hearts to so live our lives that those who cross our pathway may likewise be challenged to higher and holier living. Amen. Um, we'll open the meeting in the usual manner with a moment of silent meditation followed by the serenity prayer. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry the, this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And a young lady I met just a few weeks ago is going to read the Twelve Traditions for us. Beverly from Barnesville. I just met our speaker last night. I've been around here several days and not planning anymore. I don't make too many plans ahead of time. I goof things up when I do that. So last night I, I mentioned I haven't met Ida. 
And somebody said, well, she's been around several days. You'll see her around. Well, I didn't know who I was looking for. So how could I know? <laughs> so I made it a point to meet her last night. I've looked forward to this, too, because a lot of other people had met Ida, and I hadn't. So I've looked forward to this because when she finishes this morning, I'll know a little bit more about the route she took to find this program. And I found out in the past that I only have to hear somebody else's story to appreciate them, too. I, I, I love everybody in AA, but it seemed like the more I get to know a person, the more I learn to love them. And that's what this program, I think, is all about, sharing. And uh, so I met Ida last night. I haven't heard her, but I'm looking forward to it. Would you help me welcome Ida from Statesboro? Thank you, friend. And I'm like Father Hillary before I forget my manners. I've got CDs watch up here so I can try to look at it. Mine's so little I can't see it without my glasses. But before I forget my manners, I'd like to thank Lillian and the committee for inviting us up here. Uh, I needed it terribly, and I have certainly been filled with some renewed faith, gratitude, love, and all of the good things that I need and get from you people. I'd like to thank Steve because he's a person I always look forward to seeing. He's a bright spot in this fellowship to me. And thank June who fixed the bulletin boards outside. I noticed those immediately when we got here, and I said, who fixed the beautiful bulletin board? And when he said, June did. And I had met June back in States for several years ago, and she is very important to me. And I would like to thank all of you who have shared this weekend. You have certainly given me some more strength to go on. And I love you, and I appreciate you. Uh, I don't know why Lillian chose to put me on Sunday morning. I didn't know this until a few days ago because I'm not a Sunday morning speaker. And when I found out I didn't know who was going to be here, I came to get, not to give. But when I saw Father Hillary, I said, great day. He ne they, you all need him on Sunday morning. But... Uh, at any rate, I'm not usually even awake at this time in the morning. So, <laughs> so I want to tell you right now that whatever I say, I'm not responsible for. <laughs> and uh, because I'm a night person, and I just don't even get up until 9 o'clock in the morning, so I'm sort of unconscious. And I just want you to know I'm not responsible for whatever I say this morning. I am out of Collins. And I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. It's a beautiful group out there. And I, let me ask a question in, right in the beginning. How many of you beautiful women are alcoholics? That's great. Thank you. <laughs> it is great. Uh, you know, I'm grateful that I'm an alcoholic. Now, I don't know how you feel about it, but maybe when I get through, you'll understand. Because if I weren't an alcoholic, I would still probably be out there suffering the same illnesses that uh, got me in trouble for so long. I still have the same character defects today. Now, some of you people who have shared... Uh, Sandra, Jimmy, Thursday night, and several others, Bill, Walt, all of you, I can see so much growth in you. I want you to know that I haven't grown that much, and I still have the same defects of character that I brought with me to this program, but you have taught me how to live with those 
and how to work on those. And through this program, I can live comfortably today without the intensity of those character defects that consumed me and were destroying me. Now, alcohol was not really my problem, not altogether. It became a problem later, but it was not my problem in the beginning, nor did it cause all my defects of character. I thought when I got here that that was the only thing that was wrong with me and that alcohol had caused all of my problems. But I found out through you people that alcohol did not cause my defects of character. The defects of character were there long before I discovered the alcohol. Alcohol became an answer for me in the beginning because it helped me to justify some of these defects of character. And it was an answer to, for a while for me, for a good long while. Then later on it became the problem again. But these defects of character that I have are the reason that I say that I am really grateful that I'm an alcoholic. Because you've taught me what to do about some of these defects of character. Long before I found alcohol, I had fear, I had anger, <clears throat> excuse me, and I had resentment, I had bitterness, and I didn't know how to put a name on them. I didn't know what to do about them. I blamed everything and everybody for all of the things that happened to me, all of the things that were wrong with me. Now, Father Hillary talked about uh, these. Are, I haven't written a speech, but uh, I want to remember a couple of things that I know I'll forget if I don't look at a word there along. But Father, H Father Hillary talked about his growing up in a Christian home and that that must be a breeding ground for alcoholics. Well, if any of you out there didn't grow up in a Christian home, don't think you're not an alcoholic. Uh, that's not necessarily, nece it's not necessary to grow up in a Christian home to be an alcoholic. Now, I grew up in a home where I had a lot of love, yes. I had a lot of love for my parents, but we were not church-going people, and it's not. it wasn't a home that I would say was today, as I understand it, a good Christian home. We had a lot of fussing and fighting in my home. And as a young child, I developed a tremendous fear of what alcohol could do. So I made a resolution in the beginning that I wouldn't drink, I wouldn't marry anybody that drank, and <laughs> a lot of a lot of all these, you know, good resolutions that we make. Because I had known what it was to be afraid. I had known what it was to be sent away from home in the middle of the night. Uh, I had known what it was even as a child to lay awake and wonder, you know, what was going to happen. There was a lot of violence at times. And... I didn't know it then, but I know now that all of this was because of the fact that my parents couldn't handle alcohol. Now, alcohol was no stranger to me when I took my first drink. I had all, I'd grown up in a home where alcohol was always available. It was always present. And I took my first drink at an early age, but now I, I don't remember what age I was. I've heard some people say, you know, if you can't remember when you ter took your first drink or your last drink, you know, or this, that, and the other, that, you know, you are not an alcoholic. Well, I don't remember when I took my first drink. I don't remember about what age I was. But I do remember that it did something great for me. 
I think that I was an alcoholic from the very beginning of my drinking. Now, I don't think I was born an alcoholic because I hadn't discovered the alcohol. But I think I was an alcohol from the first drink, an alcoholic from the first drink, uh, because it did something great for me. I didn't know at the time what an alcoholic was, and I didn't know for a long time to come what an alcoholic was. But I drank for a long time with a conscious effort to control my drinking. And to me today, this is alcoholism. Uh, I drank with a lot of fear about alcohol and what it could do for me. I discovered at a very early age that my behavior was unpredictable when I drank. To me, this is, this is signs of alcoholism. There were many signs way back early that had I known anything about it, could have told me that I had trouble with it. I doubt that I would have admitted it. In fact, I never wanted to admit that I was an alcoholic. For a long time after I realized that I was, I didn't. But being an alcoholic has given me the privilege of belonging to this program. It has given me the privilege of, of meeting you people. And you have taught me about love. You have taught me about faith. You've taught me about the freedom, the freedom that I, for so long I didn't understand. When I got to, to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I came because I had a drunken husband. Now, a lot of you know C.D., a lot of you know have heard his story. You've heard him talk about the incident of, about the 45. Now, to prove to you that uh, I really haven't grown much, I want to tell you this morning that if the same it happened that he talked about today, I'd probably get the 45 again. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that it was. And you can draw your own conclusions. But... I grew up with a lot of fear, as I said, and I've had uh, a lot of resentments, even as a child. I resented the fact that my parents drank. I resented the fact that uh, I lived in the country. I didn't have a lot of friends to play with. I was a lonely child. I have one sister who is several years older than I, and she had left home when I was still a young girl and gone off to, to college. So I was alone a lot. I used daydreaming as my escape as a child. I used to fantasize, daydream. And then when I discovered the alcohol, that became my escape. I didn't drink for the fun and the partying of it. I drank for an escape. And alcohol was an escape for me for a long period of time. It released these fears. It made me fit. I never felt like I fit until I found you people. So alcohol was my escape. Now, you, I said I had made a resolution that I wouldn't drink and I wouldn't marry anybody that drank. When I was a junior in high school, a young man moved to my hometown of Swainsboro, and he was wild. He drove automobiles fast. I found out he drank. He was all of the things that I said that I never would uh, associate with. I was the kind of person I would certainly not date and certainly not marry. But you know what happened? I was attracted to him from the very beginning. Uh, I fell in love. We went together for about five years. We fought, broke up, made up, and we couldn't stay away from each other. After about five years of courtship, we decided we couldn't live without each other. It was not popular then to, you know, have a live-in <laughs> roommate of the opposite sex. So we got married against everybody's advice. My parents, his parents, our friends, everybody said, don't do it. Well... 
as you know, that uh, that just even made it more attractive to us, I guess. But we got married, and for a number of years, we didn't have any problems with alcohol. I didn't think we did at any rate. But to show you how important alcohol was to me, the early years of our marriage, when there wasn't much money at all, we would eat two meals a day so we could drink beer with our evening meal and skip the third meal because we couldn't afford to eat three meals a day and have the beer. So alcohol was important to us right in the very beginning, not causing any serious problems, but it was important to us. Now, I had drunk with a, a lot of guilt from my, the beginning of my drinking, and I was very careful where I drank and with whom I drank from the very beginning. I wouldn't drink when I went out on dates because, as I told you, I had found out that my behavior was unpredictable. And I felt very guilty when I drank. Well, now, after I got married, I felt like, you know, it's okay to drink now. You've got a husband to look after you and take care of you. You see, I'm one of these people that has always wanted somebody else to be responsible for me. And I still do today, to a great extent. I still like somebody else to be responsible for me. Well, I thought that my husband was supposed to be responsible for me. He was supposed to make me happy. He was supposed to take care of me. And uh, so I felt like it was okay now for me to drink. So as I said, we did begin drinking from the very beginning, but it was moderately. And no particular pattern to it, whatever. We went along several years like this. We had some incidents during that time that uh, were serious and could have been extremely serious as a result of drinking, but we didn't attribute it to the drinking. It was always other things. Uh, after about five years of marriage, I guess, um, we began to party more and more partying stepped up, the drinking stepped up. But the city went into the service during World War II. I went back home to live, and I drank there. He came out of the service, and uh, we went, moved to Marietta, right outside of Atlanta. Now, this is where the drinking began to, to change patterns. My drinking pattern changed. Whereas before we had just drunk on occasion, we began to create occasions to drink. Now, I didn't realize this at the time, but everything that we did began to revolve around the bottle. If we played cards, we played with drinking people. We didn't have anything to do with anybody that drank. You know, we talk about falling into to drinking crowds. Well, I don't think I ever fell into a drinking crowd. I cultivated people that did the things that I wanted to do, which was drink. So we began to create occasions to drink, we began to drink more and more. Now here again, the, uh, the guilt began to take over, and I felt extremely guilty about the amount that we were drinking and the frequency of the drinking. But there again, I did like I learned to do for more and more as time went on. I justified it with first one excuse and then the other. This continued to be the pattern until C.D. again went back into the service, and we began moving around this time. This was during the Korean War. We went out to California, and this is where we began to do a lot of partying. We partied a lot. We drank a lot. We moved back from California to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and then it was drinking every night, the drinking pattern began to, to increase. It was every night. I justified this with being in the service. Everybody's doing it. But I still had a lot of guilt. This is where I began to drink some during the day. On Sunday mornings, we got up and went to the, to the officers club and we drank. So drinking became a way of life rather than just, just a side part of the life. It became a way of life with us. Well, something happened about here that uh, that changed the pattern again. City had to go overseas, and I was left alone. 
Now, Sidney had been my drinking partner. He had brought the booze home, or we went together and drank. Well, when he went overseas, I was pregnant at the time. I had to move back to Statesboro, there again looking for somebody to take care of me and look after me. This is where my sister lived. So I moved back there so that she could take care of me and look after me while my husband was gone. Well, now, I had never had to face responsibilities, and I had never known what it was to grow up. I was a child. I was a child, but I was the mother of two children and expecting a third. The drinking had become so much a part of my life until there was a deep need for it now. This year that he was overseas was a very miserable year. I know now that the alcoholism, my alcoholism, had progressed and continued to progress during this year, although I didn't know at the time. But I was miserable during this year. I didn't have my drinking partner, and I could not bring myself. Bullock County is a dry county. I could not or would not allow myself to go to the county line and buy the liquor. I somehow or another couldn't justify it. But I drank occasionally during this period of time, not often, but I was miserable. When City came back from overseas, I was delighted to get my drinking partner back. And we picked up supposedly where we had left off. But as you know, the progressiveness of the illness, we didn't pick up where we had left off. We picked up where we had progressed to. We began at the point that we had progressed to. And the point now was that we were drinking every night. I was having terrible hangovers from the drinking. I got up every morning and I swore off. CD was a different man that had left. I say a lot of times I've been married to three different people, and I I feel like I really have, although it's one and the same. But he had changed. I didn't know what had happened to him, but he had changed. Now, I thought it was the wars, and I said it was the wars for a long time. But he was a drunk. <laughs> and uh, I knew what a drunk was now. I remembered what a drunk was from way back. But I still didn't know what an alcoholic was. But I knew he was a drunk. Now, I put a lot of other labels on him besides the being a drunk. He was a sorry, no good drunk. Now, some of you were fortunate enough just to have a nice, you know, drunk that didn't bother anybody. But uh, City wasn't that kind of drunk. And he's not that kind of man. Now, he's not the quiet subdued kind of person that doesn't bother anybody. He's going to bother everybody uh, that's around him, whether he's drunk or sober. You know he's there. (laughs) Bobby and Joe told me to tell his story this morning, and I'm just about doing it. (laughs) And tell you the real story. (laughs) But... uh, I knew he was a drunk, and we began now to have a lot of trouble. We had been married 10 years at this time, and uh, we never had fussed much since the marriage. We fussed a lot before we got married, but after we got married, you know, we didn't fuss much. We had a very close relationship, and uh, we didn't fuss, but now we began to fuss and do all of the things that we had always said we never would do. We accused each other of everything we could think of. I began to blame him for everything that was happening in our home, and our home began to fall apart at this stage. We had moved back to Marietta, and uh, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. This is where these old character defects that I told you about began to surface. Again, I began to hate. I began to resent. I got bitter. I got sicker and sicker. I know today that I was much, much sicker 
than C.D. was. Now, I blamed him for everything that was wrong with me, and I believed it. The denial part of our illness is one of the strongest, I think, symptoms of the illness. I truly thought that if this man would stop drinking and straighten up and act like a decent husband and a decent father, that everything would be all right. I, not until I found you people did I learn that everything would not have been all right because I was not all right. No matter what he had done, everything wouldn't have been all right. But we fought and we argued and we threatened. I tried threatening. I tried begging. I tried calling the minister to come to the house. And I even made C.D. swear on the Bible. <laughs> uh, I hadn't thought about that in a long time until that very minute. But I remember, <laughs> I remember calling the minister to come over to our house and making C.D. swear on the Bible. I was so sick until I got to the point that I wouldn't have anything to do with anybody. I also had the defect of character of pride. Now, this was a strong, strong defect of character in my life. It bothers me today. But I had a lot of pride, and I didn't want anybody to know that my husband was doing the things that I thought he was doing. I was ashamed and I was embarrassed. Now, you see, I'm not talking much here about my drinking. And the reason I'm not is because I'm not looking at it at this period of time. Well, things didn't get better. They got worse. So I felt like, well, you know, if I can get away from this man, I'll be all right. I had had to go back to work, and I resented this. And this was one of the, the things that I had the hardest time resolving, was the resentment and the bitterness at the fact that I had had to go back to work and leave my children. But I went back to work, and this had to change my pattern of drinking again. So I found out I couldn't get up and go to work with the hangovers that I had. I had horrible hangovers. So I stopped drinking. Now, I don't know about you all, but maybe you can pinpoint some point in time in your alcoholism when you were able to stop. Well, I stopped drinking at this time. Somehow or other, I found out, and I, I realized deep down, without even knowing that, uh, that this was what it was, but I realized that I couldn't stop when I started. And that I never knew when I went out and, and decided to take one or two drinks whether I'd end up drunk and passed out or whether I'd be able to take the one or two. See, the control now was was slipping away entirely, but, but I had some at, at certain times, and this was very confusing and frustrating to me. But I stopped drinking at this time, and then I really raised hell with him. Uh, I told him... Every opportunity, what a sorry, no good person he was. Well, after a period of time, I decided if I got away from him, everything would be all right. So I left him and went back to Statesboro, where my sister was again, and thought that now I've gotten rid of the, the problem. It was the man. Now everything, I can do the things that I've always wanted to do and that I would have done if I hadn't had that sorry man. For a short period of time, I didn't drink. I had to find a job. I had to find a place to live. So for a short period of time, I didn't drink. But it was a very short period of time. I don't remember how long, a few weeks. And then I began to feel the need to drink again. Now, City at this time had moved to Birmingham, Alabama. I'm in Statesboro, Georgia. And I'm drinking at him now. You see, I drank before him, I drank with him, I drank at him, and I drank at, at everything and everybody because of and so on. But now I'm drinking because of and at him. I had all the bitterness and all the resentments and all the anger and all of the hostility that, that I had taken with me. I thought I had left the problem behind. And it was not until I got to this program that I found out 
that I had taken the problem with me and that the problem was me. Well, now this changed my pattern of drinking again. I began now to drink every night and still go to work during the day. I withdrew again from everybody. I wouldn't talk to anybody on the phone at night because I didn't want anybody to hear me, hear the slurring. I drank every night until I went to bed. Now, I had begun having blackouts way back in Marietta before I left CD. Now I'm in Statesboro. I don't have CD. I've divorced CD. And I'm drinking every night alone, and I'm still having blackouts. I didn't know what blackouts were, but I know today that that's what it was. I couldn't remember the next day. I'm going to the county line and buying the booze. I started out buying a pint, and then I soon found out that that took too many crips to the county line, so I began buying fifths, and from then on I never bought anything but fifths. But I bought the bottle and I took it home and I, I was, I drank it home alone. Now we were divorced for a year. And during this period of time, my drinking got worse and worse and I got sicker and sicker. After about a year, I know today that God began to really take over in my life. Now God had been working in my life all this time. But he took over at this point because I had become unable to do anything for myself. He sent this sorry, no good man back to me. Now, I resented that. When I got to this program, I not only resented everything and everybody, but I resented the God that, that I knew at that time because I felt like he was punishing me all the time. I never could figure out why. But I spent a lot of times, why me, God? Today I spend a lot of time saying, why me, God? But today it's, why am I so fortunate? Why have I been so blessed? And at that time it was, why are you punishing me this way? We were remarried. And I resented that because I didn't want to remarry CD. And I know today <laughs> I didn't want I didn't want any part of it. I felt like I was trapped, and uh, I had three children that, to support, and I couldn't support them. So I felt like you know nothing better had come along. <laughs> So since he was the only one that was available, I took him. But this marriage couldn't have lasted. There's no way in the world this marriage could have lasted without the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I, I took on a, another mask, if you will. You see, I wore masks all the time. I wore whatever mask fitted the occasion. But I took on another mask and another identity. Now, I took on the defect of self-righteousness. And I became very self-righteous. I became the martyr. I had given this man another chance, I thought. And this is what I would have told you. The truth of the matter was that I needed him. And now, we had talked a lot about his drinking, and he had sworn off and so on and so forth. But now, when we were remarried, we didn't drink for a while right in the very beginning, a few weeks now, and I resented that because he was interfering with my drinking. See, he had brought the bottle home, and I could blame him for it, and now he wasn't bringing the bottle home, and I resented that. I wanted to drink, and I needed to drink. But after a few weeks of not drinking, now, we still didn't know anything about alcoholism. We had never heard of of Alcoholics Anonymous, not consciously. I, I had never heard the word alcoholic or Alcoholics Anonymous, so far as I know. But we began to drink again after a few weeks, not knowing that uh, one drink 
one drunk, or it was the first drink that caused the problem. And I know today that I was glad when he started back drinking. Now, I didn't want him to get drunk and spend all the money and wreck all the automobiles and do all these things that were causing me problems, but I wanted him to drink so I'd have my drinking partner back. Uh, the drinking now got worse fast. It was not at all a gradual thing. It was real fast, and I'm grateful today for this. Uh, when we were first married, I was still blaming him. I was still telling him how lucky he was, you know, to have me and all this. And I told him on every occasion that I could what a big person I was and how fortunate he was to have me back. Not in so many words, but I let him know in my own little ways how fortunate he was to have me back. And, you know, he accepted this. He accepted it. I know now that God sent him back to me because this is the only way I would have found this program. I never would have had the courage to walk in the door, I don't think. I think I would have died out there. I think there are a lot of us women who do die because we don't have the courage or because of some of our old ideas about the morality of drinking. I didn't know that alcoholism was a disease, an illness, and I wouldn't have believed it if you had told me. But this was the man that was to get me to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. This marriage was a disaster from the very beginning. Our own, only communication at this point was the bottle. Uh, we would go to the county line and, and get a bottle, and we'd drive down there. It's 12 miles. We'd drive down there in complete silence, and the minute the bottle was in the car we, and we started back towards Statesboro, we could talk. It's a strange thing to me today. I still don't understand a lot about the illness of alcoholism, but it's a strange thing to me even today how just getting the bottle in our hands relieves the anxiety and the tension within us before we even have to have the drink. But we'd get this bottle, and we'd go back home, and we'd talk, and we could be civil to each other. Now, I don't mean to tell you that every day and every night of this year and a half of our last drinking was this was you know fussing and fighting it wasn't a lot of it was the stony silence and a lot of it you know some of it was even fairly good but the most of it was bad because see I still had all of these defects of character I still had all of the bitterness and the resentment I told you that I was sicker than he was. I think I was one of the sickest people I have ever seen come into this program. I was consumed with it. There was no place in my heart for any love or for any acceptance or for any gratitude or for any faith. Now, I had long since stopped praying because I had prayed for a long time for the things that I felt like I needed and the things I wanted. And I prayed knowing that I wasn't going to get it. The God of my understanding at that time was a punishing, vengeful being. I didn't know what, but just something or somebody up there that was keeping tabs on everything I did wrong. And everything I did was wrong. If I wasn't doing it, I was thinking it. Now, I grew up in one of these Baptist homes, Father Hillary, that you talked about, and, and I had learned somewhere along the way, and I won't say I was taught this because I really don't know, but I learned somewhere that it was just as bad to think it as it was to do it. So I was always, you know, guilty. I was always running scared. Uh, I tried to hide, but I had long since stop praying because I knew that my prayers weren't going to be answered. I thought that prayer was to ask for whatever you wanted, and if you didn't get it, then, you know, the answer was no. And that God, I felt that God had deserted me and forsaken me. Uh, 
things got worse and worse between us. The drinking got worse. My bitterness got worse. And everything was fixing to come to a end with us again. When C.D. decided to look for some help, he had read in some, the paper someplace about a place in Atlanta that helped people with their drinking. Well, I told him I felt like it was a good idea for him to go, to go anywhere. <laughs> I wanted to get rid of him again. I, had got, I wanted to get rid of him and get him out of my house. Now, he's the kind of guy that's hard to get rid of. Uh, I'm grateful today that, that he is, because if I could have gotten rid of him, I assure you I would have. But I felt like if I could get him out of the house again and get him up there with his mother, I felt like she deserved him anyway. <laughs> That's another long story about <laughs> But I felt like she deserved him, and he deserved her. Now, you can take that any way you want to. <laughs> But I wanted him up there with her. Well, when he mentioned going, I said, that's fine. I really think you should go. Now, call your mother and get her to come get you. <laughs> well, he did. He called his mother, and she came, got him, and she took him to Atlanta. And he went to a treatment center up there. Now, I was going, as quick as I could, I was going to get a divorce again because I feel, well, you know, that's the only way I'm going to keep him from coming back down here. But I didn't quite have, have time to get it all finalized. He was up there for six weeks, and he asked me to come up. And I said, no way. I'm not coming up there. I don't want to hear those people tell me what my Christian duty is. And I don't want to hear those people tell me how, you know, great you are. In the first place, I resented him being up there. It was a beautiful place. It had a swimming pool, and it had women, and I knew he liked women. <laughs> he does today. <laughs> uh, that's no threat to me today, though, thank God. That's another blessing of this program. But I felt like he was up there having fun, and, and uh, everybody was giving him a lot of attention and love, and, and here I am down in Statesboro with all these problems and all these children, and I resented him for, for being there, and I hated him. I still hated everything and everybody anyway. But I wouldn't go until finally I was bribed to go. Now, I told you that I, I still, I don't do the things that I know I'm supposed to do today. But then I didn't do anything that anybody wanted me to do. And uh, if you wanted me to, if he wanted me to come up there, I wasn't about to go. Well, the way I went was his mother told me she'd pay a note at the bank if I'd go. So I went, unwillingly, but I went. And of course, I got up there, and they didn't tell me what my Christian duty was. Uh, I was very surprised, but I was very close-minded, and I, I, I really didn't listen to anything that I heard. When C.D. came back to Statesboro, he tried to tell me some of the things that they had told him there, and I could tell that something had happened to C.D., and I resented this. But he had gotten something that I had been looking for for a long time. He had some peace of mind, and he was different. Now, I was so sick that I resented this. He said that they had told him for us to look for something called Alcoholics Anonymous and to go. And I thought, now, you know, I'm not interested in that. If I can't get him sober, nobody can. And I hadn't been able to get him sober. So we didn't, there was not a group in Statesboro. There was a group in Savannah, which was only 50 miles away. There was a group in Augusta, which was... 70 miles and so on, but we didn't go, and things rocked on. Now, he stayed sober about 10 months, and I drank during this period of time. I drank, and I slipped around and drank. I lied about it. He told me that they had told him drinking was his problem and that uh, he didn't have the right to ask me not to drink. 
Well, I want to tell you today that that may be true. But I know from my own experience that if I had to live around somebody that was drinking every day, personally, I don't know how long it would take me to join them if it was CD especially because we had we had been drinking partners all this time. But I continued to drink, and he stayed sober for several months. And then a group was formed in Statesboro. Now, this is where my life began to change. We went to AA, and I went to get, you know, to make people think, there again, to impress you, make people think that I was willing to do anything to help this man. I really went because we didn't have any place else to go, and nobody was having anything to do with us at this time. And I found some people who seemed to have something that I would like to have. I wasn't sure what it was you had, and I didn't think I could get it. But you seemed to have something that I would like to have. We went to Savannah to some meetings. And one night, they said, tonight's closed meeting night. All the A's go upstairs and all the al stay downstairs. And I didn't know what an al was. But I sat there until I could see how they were separating, and most of the men got up and went upstairs, and the ladies stayed downstairs, so you know where I stayed. Uh, so I was, this was my first introduction to al And I want to say today that I'm grateful to the al program and to me, I see no difference in the Al-Anon and the AAs. I don't feel the separation that some people feel. Personally, I think that it's a family illness. And I needed everything. I needed all of it. But I went to Al-Anon for about two years. And I think this was the thing that I needed at this period of time. This gave me an opportunity to... Look at me. It gave me an opportunity to get rid of some of this bitterness and the resentments that I had inside me. This is where I began to to get acquainted with Ida. I began to get a little honesty. And I began to see the res- part that my drinking had played in our lives and what it had done to destroy me. I came into the program in 1959, actually. Uh, And I stayed dry. I liked what, I think it was Bill the other night that said, sobriety. I never had heard that word, but I liked that because I think that's, that's what I was for about two years. I was dry. But I was still miserable. I still had a lot of these painful feelings and then there again something happened that uh, I couldn't accept and I couldn't face. I still hadn't done any growing. But I found out I was pregnant. And uh, I thought, now, God, you've done it to me again. <laughs> you're still out to get me, and you're still after me. And I got drunk at him. I got drunk again. My sobriety date is July 21st, 1962. And I think this is when I really began to try to work the program. Now, somebody said the other night that he felt like in order for us to to stay sober, we had to work the program. Well, I wholeheartedly agree with that for me. Now, I feel like, for me, I can come to meetings, and I can stay dry, and I can stay fairly comfortable a lot of the time just through your strength and your love and the fellowship and the meeting. But now, I'm not going to get better in the other areas of my illness. Now, we're told that this is a threefold illness. 
It's an illness of the mind, the body, and the spirit, mental, physical. Uh, I think for me that my recovery came physically first. And I feel like that I can recover physically through coming to meetings and associating with you people. I think I can stay dry. But I'm not going to recover mentally and spiritually unless I start working the steps of the program. The program is the steps to me. You people taught me about it. You taught me what the program is, and you helped me to work it. You help remind me when I'm not working it. And I began, I think, in 62 to try to work the program to some degree, and I think I began slowly to do a little bit of growing. I think I'm still growing today. I have a lot of slips today. I have mental attitude slips, a lot of them. I'd like to make a confession right now. Eighteen and a half years of sobriety, or of dryness, however you might see it. And I have just been through one of my real bad slips. I am still somewhat in it, but, you know, when Lillian called me and asked me if I would come and talk, my first inclination was to say no. You see, I still like to do things the easy way. I still don't like to work. Uh, I want you to do it for me. Uh, not because I didn't want to come. I've, I've been to a lot of these fellowships, and this is a very important fellowship to me. It's one of my favorites. It's small, and each and every one of you has a very special place in my heart. But I didn't want to talk, you know. Talking is very painful to me. I'm a listener. I'm not really a talker. Uh, and I don't feel that, that I'm, a, I'm sure I'm not, and I know I'm not. I don't have anything profound to say, and I'm not a speaker. And I, I, don't, I know I'll never be a speaker. But you've told me that all I have to do is share. And you've also taught me that you love me, and that you love me warts and all. You love me in spite of me. Well, I needed to come up here because I have been in a real bad depression. I think there are several reasons for it. I've been physically sick, but that's not the main reason. I've been spiritually sick. So I needed to come. And there again, God was doing for me what I could not or would not do for myself through Lillian. I've learned that God works through people, and that's the way he's worked in my life. He continues to work through you people. But I began immediately to feel better when I was on my way up here. I began to feel better. And I have continued to feel better ever since I got here. I have a renewed faith since I got here. I have gratitude again since I got here. My gratitude was, was at a very low ebb. Now, knowing all the things that I have to be grateful for and feeling the gratitude are two altogether different things for me. And I, I know today that we have more to be grateful for than anybody I've seen in this program. And I know that every day of my life. But there are times when I'm unable to really feel the gratitude that I know I should feel. You see, God has blessed us more than anybody else I know of. Cindy and I were both crazy before we ever got to this program. Now, I say that with all sincerity. Anybody that was as stupid and as ignorant and as crazy as we two to come into this program and just through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous to get a, a quiet, get a little bit of sanity, 
a little bit of humility, a little bit of serenity, then we've been blessed more than we could ever have dreamed of. You people have given me a God of my understanding that today watches over me and takes care of me and supplies my every need. Now, he doesn't give me everything I want, and I've learned to be grateful for that, because if I had the things that I wanted and asked for, I'd be in deep trouble again. I get way off the track, and I get in trouble when I begin to take over and try to run my life again. But he gives me the things I need. Now, C.D. and I have a, a beautiful marriage, and I want to say that because I'll forget to. I get to telling you how sorry and no good he is, and I forget to tell you <laughs> sometimes that we do have a beautiful marriage. And it's not all peaches and cream because we fight sometimes. We fight a lot of times. Uh, short little rounds, as he calls them. <laughs> but see, I'm strong-willed, and he's strong-willed, and we run together and we have a short round. But, you know, I found out, too, that that's okay. It's okay for me to fight as long as I fight fair and don't carry resentment. It's okay for me not to be perfect. It's okay to make a lot of mistakes. And I can accept me to a great degree now. But we have a beautiful relationship, and I'm grateful for this. And this came through this program, and you people. I need him today more than I've ever needed him. I need the support and the love, and I feel very secure in that, and I'm very grateful for him. I also need this program today more than I ever had. I need it today more than I ever have because if without this program, I would again have the resentments and the bitterness and all of these things that if I hold on too long enough, I'll drink again. I told you in the beginning that I was grateful that I'm an alcoholic, and that's the reason. Now, I feel sorry for the people out in this world who don't have the privilege of being a part of our program. They have problems just like we do, but they don't have a program, you know. Father Hiller, I think we're the chosen few. I think we're God's favorite people. I think God gave us the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. He designed it for us because he loved us and because he does love us. So we are fortunate in my opinion, to be alcoholics because we do have a place that we can go. We have the people that love us and give us the support. I need you terribly every day. Joe told me Thursday night or whenever when I was telling him I'd been depressed, I knew he would understand that. Now, I used to wouldn't have been able to share that with anybody. I couldn't share me with you at all. But I told him that I had been depressed, and I know Joe went through a period of time when he had a long depression. And he says, well, you know where I am? I said, yeah, I know where you are. But you know, sometimes we get into such a, a condition until we're unable to do the things for ourselves that we know we need to do. You see, and I, I kind of let myself slip into that. Now, C.D. has been very supportive, and when I told him, I said, I, I don't really think I'm able to go to Pine Mountain. I'm, I'm sick. <laughs> and I was sick. <laughs> I, I was sick last weekend. I, I have been sick. I've been sick with the flu for over two weeks, and last weekend we were supposed to go to Cleveland, and he went without me because I didn't feel up to it, and I didn't go. And I stayed home and, and rested, and, and I felt fine to come up here. But I said, I don't think I can go. I'm sick. <laughs> he said, yes, you can go, too. He said, you're going. <laughs> so he took over and did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And Joe said, yeah, he knew he knew that feeling of, 
of getting into the, this condition where we can't do for ourselves. But I do know that you're here, and you are, the, you are my strength. I thank you for sharing your love and your strength with me. I thank you for all of the things that you have given to me. You taught me about faith. You taught me about love. And you introduced me to the God of my understanding today. Now, I told you that I'm the God of my understanding today is the one that has allowed me to have some suffering experiences. And, you know, I thought I hadn't grown at all in this program till a, a few years ago. But... Something happened in my life after about seven years of sobriety that made it necessary for me to let go and let God. All of these little slogans that we have on our walls that I thought were so ridiculous when I first saw them have taken on deep meaning to me. I think they're very, very important parts of our program, really. The serenity prayer is a, a extremely important part of my program today, but it made it necessary for me to let go and let God. And I had that experience, and it was a spiritual experience. Now, I didn't do this willingly. I did it out of desperation. When I was unable to do anything else, I turned my life over to the care of God at that particular point. I turned my life over. I turned my children's lives over to the care of God. And do you know that that's when I knew that everything was going to work out okay? I'm not going into any detail about that. A lot of you know about that experience. But this is when I, I really knew that God would and could if he were sought. Because he could and he did. Now, I take it back a lot. I take my life back over a lot, and then that's when I get into trouble. But this was a spiritual experience for me, and this allowed me to know that it's through these painful experiences that we do grow. So today I've learned to be grateful for suffering painful experiences. I would never choose to have one, but I have learned to be grateful for them because it's only through them that I grow. Maybe you grow other ways, but that's the only way I grow. I'm so resistant and so rebellious and so self-willed and self-centered until I, I try to run things myself and I try to manage and I try to control and I take responsibility for other people and their happiness and their lives and I get in serious trouble. But if I can let go and let God, it works out. So I'm grateful today to you who have taught me this. I'm grateful for the many, many blessings that I have received through this program and through you people. And I'm grateful for the God of my understanding today. I don't ever want to forget that I was sick and I was hopeless and that you people showed me the way to the freedom, the freedom to be me, the freedom to love, the freedom to allow you to love me. I hope I never forget where it came from. I'm grateful for all of the experiences that I've had now that I was so bitter about for so long because it's only through these that I would have found you. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.